And yet another episode in the thrilling story of the Golden City. Another nugget from the Golden City of Rossland and to help us uh, delve into the history of Rossland, B.C., here's Jack McDonald of the Rossland Museum. Jack, what do we have this time? Well, Dave, I think we'll call this one a smelter for the mines of Rossland. And, of course, it goes back to the original building of the trail smelter here, mm -hmm. which was built to treat the ores from the mines of Rossland. Around 1892-93, when the Rossland mines were just beginning to open up, uh, they had to ship all their ore to Butte, Montana. And, of course, this uh, wasn't uh, the most economic way of operating these mines. And uh, transportation was practically nil. There were no railroads. And uh, there were wagon roads that were built from Rossland to Northport and from Rossland to Trail. And the ore was being shipped out both ways. Uh, the ore that came to Trail, of course, went on river barges and down to Northport. Mm -hmm. The ore that went direct to Northport uh, was loaded on trains on the uh, Spokane Falls and Northern Railway to, to be shipped to Butte, Montana. The Spokane Falls and Northern Railway, of course, at that time came as far as Northport. But anyway, just to give you an idea of the uh, amount of haulage that was going on, the Leroy Mine had, on, at one time in 19, 1892, had 40 ore wagons on order. But it was pretty rough going because the roads would get muddy and bogged down in the springtime. Mm -hmm and uh, they were not able to meet their commitments always, and this raised uh, problems at the smelting end. Of course, they had contracts to meet, and the ore wasn't arriving, and there was friction being built up. And uh, just as an aside here, though, uh, one of the people who ran a, an ore freight line between Ross and Northport was Jimmy Vipon's father. And I think we had in the golden years uh, a mention by Jimmy of, of this. I believe we did, yes. Yeah. Yes. Anyhow, by 1895, the uh, Leroy and the Center Star and the War Eagle were all amongst those shipping, and uh, the Russian camp was really picking up by this time. So uh, our friend F. Augustus Heinz, who was the Copper King, I suppose we should do a story on him sometime. He was one of the Copper Kings uh, in Butte, Montana. Uh, he had sent uh, two or three of his lieutenants into this area to very quietly stake out uh, ground for a smelter mm -hmm. and size up the whole situation. And before anybody really knew much about it, they had purchased one-third of, of Topping's town site here, Trail, of course, which is the ground we now know as Tadnac, uh, which is the ground that the smelter is on at the present time. Right. So in 1896, Heinz, uh, who incidentally was only 24 years old when he did all this. Oh, is that right? Yes. I always <laughs> pictured, I don't know why, but picture Heinz as a, a gentleman, a, a very pompous looking gentleman, a very proper looking gentleman of about 55, 60. I don't know why. No, Heinz <laughs> died before he reached that age. Oh, is that right? Yes, he oh. died quite young. But he was a very brilliant young man. And uh, that's a whole story in itself, which perhaps we should talk about on one of these programs. But anyway, Heinz built this smelter at Trail, the first smelter at Trail, which he called the BC Smelting Company. And uh, their first contract was with the Leroy Mining Company in Rossland. And of course, he built his Columbian Western Railway to Rossland, to, which was the narrow gauge, to bring the ore down to his smelter here. Same time, he also built a standard gauge line from here to Robson so that they could uh, do away with the river boats on the lower part of the river and tie into the steamer service on the Arrow Lakes. Now, one of the things Heinz did at the same time, he was a very astute person, he managed to get a, a charter for his Columbian Western Railway from the British Columbia government, which allowed him to build from trail here on the Columbia River right through to Penticton in the Okanagan. And all this, of course, comes at a time when both the CPR and the Great Northern are, are looking for routes, competitive routes, across southern British Columbia. And uh, Heinz naturally uh, must have been quite aware of all this. So this was the bait. And uh, the CPR were very anxious to get a hold of that Columbian Western Charter and to get across southern British Columbia before Jim Hill and his Great Northern could do this, mm -hmm. the job for them. So the CPR looked, uh, sort of made a, an offer to Heinz, but of course Heinz wanted uh, too much money for their liking. And they backed off, and at this stage, uh, Van Horn of the CPR 
uh, hired Walter Hull Aldridge. Uh, we have his name still in trail here in Aldridge Avenue. Right. And Walter Hull Aldridge was appointed by the CPR to come out here and deal with Heinz right on the spot. And one of the interesting things is that uh, Aldridge was a classmate of Heinz from the Columbia School of Mines, so they knew each other and knew each other's tactics. Mm -hmm. This made it a rather interesting game. <laughs> well, um, there was no way that Heinz was coming down in his price, so Aldridge backed off and, and uh, took another tack. He let it be known that the CPR were planning to build a smelter of their own at Blueberry on the flats out there, and uh, made all the motions of ordering equipment and so forth. And I guess uh, Heinz probably decided that maybe they were sincere about this and maybe they weren't, but in any way, he decided he would reopen negotiations. Well, they still couldn't agree on a price, so uh, Heinz agreed to an arbitrator, which was probably the best way to handle it. And uh, the legend has it, of course, that Heinz being the, the swinger that he was, he wanted to play poker for it for this uh, extra that he was trying to charge the CPR and winner take all. But of course, uh, as Walter Aldridge pointed out, there were too many Methodists on the director of the CPR <laughs> to allow him to do this. <laughs> In any case, uh, they decided that the JSC Fraser, who was the popular manager of the Bank of Montreal in Rossman at that time, would be the arbiter. Mm -hmm. Now. He didn't know anything about this because this was all decided down here in Trail uh, sometime during the evening where they'd been arguing between themselves. So what they decided to do at that time was to hire a, a horse and a rig and a driver and they set off for Rossman sometime in the late evening, quite late evening as a matter of fact, and got to Rossman and rooted poor Fraser out of bed and appointed him arbiter. And uh, the arbitration uh, actually took place in the famous old Rossman Club again, which is something that we should probably talk yeah, about. Yeah, is that someday. a story yes. itself? And it went on into the wee small hours of the morning, but when daylight finally broke, uh, Canadian Pacific Railway was the new owner of Heinz's smelter, and uh, Aldrich was appointed manager, and uh, they called it the Canadian Smelting Works. And uh, <coughs> from 1898 on, for the next few years, they operated as such, but Aldridge had a hard time. He, his ore supply was unsettled. The Leroy mine had uh, built their own smelter at Northport, mm -hmm. and uh, transportation costs were high, and he was having his problems. And uh, the city, the town of Trail, was feeling hard times as a result of this. And you know, it was touch and go whether this thing would survive or not. So Aldridge put it direct to the Canadian Pacific Railway they would either have to get into the mining business or get out of the smelting business, one or the other. So he finally convinced his directors that uh, they should start talks amongst the mine owners in Rossland toward consolidation. And I should mention some of the other things that were making it a little bit tough for Aldrich to smelter at that time was that they'd had a strike in Rossland in 1900, which lasted about 10 months. Mm -hmm. And the eight-hour law had come into effect, which of course meant an extra shift, which cut down the, or added to the cost of mining. And the Leroy litigation had had a bad effect on the Rosslyn camp. And all these things made it a little bit difficult to carry on a profitable smelting work yeah. down here. The only bright spot was that the Crow's Nest Railway had been completed in 1898, and uh, coking coal was coming in cheaper than it could be brought in from Vancouver. But in any case, uh, even in Rosslyn, there had been talks of amalgamation between various properties, and one of these was the War Eagle and the Center Star. They found that operating costs were such, and ore values were falling off, to the point where it was profitable to get together and not operate as separate companies, but begin to amalgamate. So Aldrich arranged that uh, uh, officers from War Eagle, Center Star, the Rosslyn Power Company, the Leroy, and the St. Eugene Consolidated Mining Company at Moye would get together and discuss amalgamation. Now, that uh, Rosslyn Power Company I mentioned there is not, uh, has nothing to do with the West Kootenai or the Rosslyn uh -huh. Water and Lake Company. That was a little steam plant owned by the Warrego Company, which uh, 
only generated enough power for some small use around the War Eagle. I That's see. just an aside here in case somebody <laughs> wonders. <laughs> Well, these talks went on very well, but at the last minute, the Leroy Mining Company backed out, and uh, they never did join the consolidation. Is that right? Uh, as we said in another program on the Leroy, that they finally wound up their affairs in 1910, and the Consolidated Mining Smelling Company purchased their assets. Yeah, at that yeah, time. right, right. Mm -hmm. However, by 1905, they did it finally, though, become part they of. They ultimately yeah. did only after they had wound up their right. own affairs. But by 1905. Walter Aldrich, Aldrich was able to report that the War Eagle, the Center Star, the Rossland Power Company, and the St. Eugene Mine at Moye, and the Canadian Smelting Works at Trail had amalgamated to form the Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company of Canada Limited, and uh, that the company would no longer be dependent on a single source of supply for ore and would be in a position to expand into the industrial world as it saw fit. And uh, as a reward for his good work in bringing this about, Walter Aldrich was made the managing director of the CMNS as we knew it for so many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an aside here, in 1911, the Leroy assets were bought up, and in 1916, Consolidated Mining and Smelling Company absorbed the West Kootenai Power and Lake Company, which we had mentioned in another program, absorbed it as a wholly owned subsidiary. And in 1929, the Rosslyn mines shut down, and uh, the Consolidated Mining Smelting Company went pretty well into the base metal business, based on, of course, the big Sullivan mine at Kimberley, which they had acquired. Right. And uh, after 1950, uh, Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company of Canada Limited was a fairly long title, although the company up until that time had been very proud of it and always insisted the of Canada part appear on the letterheads because it's still a Canadian-owned company. At that time, it uh, was decided that they would shorten the handle, and of course, since then, they've been officially known as Cominco Limited. And that, of course, now is the worldwide mm -hmm. Cominco. Right. But it all started with topping and his $12.50 okay. and Fantastic. the Leroy Mine. And, and Cominco, with its many, many outlets, now it's just unbelievable the way That's this right. mushroom, is not it? That's right. It must have been a very sad time in Rossland in, in 29 when the mines finally shut down. Well, they started to shut down in 1927, and it was sort of a gradual shutdown over a period of two years. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. Rossland, at that time, people wondered whether Rossland would survive. And the hill became quiet. It was quite depressing. But as luck would have it at that time, highways were becoming what they are today. Mm -hmm. And the highway between Trail and Rossland was improved to the point where Rosslyn could become a residential town, and the Rosslyn Cooperative Transportation Society right. was one of the first in the country. Uh, it was through such efforts as this that Rosslyn was able to survive. Of course, now it survives as a residential Very city with a 10-minute uh, commuting time between them. A lovely place in which to live, and but, uh, uh, don't forget, when you're traveling through Rosslyn or visiting, or if you live in Rosslyn and have not yet done so, be sure to see the museum. Right, because all this story is in the Rossland Museum. This is why the Ross Museum is there. Thank you, Jack. Well, there's uh, another nugget from the Golden City. We'll have more in this series. We invite you to stay tuned as we visit with Jack McDonald of the Rossland Museum.